We are so glad you're here this evening. Appreciate all of that. You have been commenting that you really liked our series that's, that's been taking place. We've got some good topics and good lessons coming up as will be visited by the several preachers from the area. And tonight we're happy to have Ted Spencer and his wife with him. I learned a little bit of their history, but, I, but I'm going to ask Ted to tell you a little bit tell you a little bit about his preaching history, but he's been down in the Sparta area in Christian County for quite a while. Now, how many years, Ted? 19. 19 years working with the congregation there. That speaks well of him and also the congregation. And I know they uh, are working hard to evangelize, and I was able to attend a seminar down there. Uh, what was that? About just before COVID hit, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, I think so. And, and Rob Whitaker, and it was very good, and I'm thankful they've done it, and they're focused on evangelism as, as we are here, and we, we were talking and talking about the fact that with the changes in the world, the way we're going to grow is to reach out, and we want to thank you all for doing that, especially our folks that they are working in the jail, that produced fruit, had four baptisms this last Sunday, that was wonderful. And as you know, recently Jerry was baptized, and we've got a number of other studies going on currently and that's wonderful please pray for that work that it continues in the, the work of the congregation here also for our harmony one of the things that Satan can do is to split us apart right we don't want that we're going to stand up to that and keep loving each other and I appreciate all of you that greet your visitors and show kindness and love and send cards and all the good things that go along with that and I just appreciate so much that, that kind of love and harmony working together and what did we Saturday right Working together, chasing chasing a truck with a float in the parade to give out water and candy. I'm still sore. How about the rest of you? In fact, I went to the doctor this afternoon for a wellness check, and they said, how are you doing? I was afraid to tell them. <laughs> Every time you say something hurts, they give you a pill for it. I didn't need more of them, so I didn't even tell them. But enough of that. We're, we've got several announcements we're going to make. Uh, one, just real quick. I'm not going to make it. We're going to save this for announcements. But um, Saturday will be the setup day for VBS, so please be here at about nine o'clock, and we'll be working to set set things up, and get that ready for VBS. We will have a short meeting tonight, uh, reference to VBS. We'll just go ahead and meet in the back. Uh, so as soon as we're dismissed, those of you that are involved with VBS as teachers helpers. Uh, if you can, please attend that. It will, I promise you, be, be short. I'll, I'll work to keep it that way. And then we'll have another meeting Sunday evening where we'll get finalized for what's going to happen Monday morning. And I appreciate all of you that have been working hard on that. I know Linda's been working hard on that, and that's really good to get organized and have those things in motion. Steve, thank you, and you, Michelle, and all the work you did already, and we'll be doing more, and we appreciate all that so much. Let's begin this evening with a word of prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we're just so thankful that we can have this time to come together, to study your word, to learn, and to better prepare ourselves, Father, for reaching out to the world and teaching the truth. And Father, we pray you give us the courage to stand in defense of that truth and be able to answer those questions that come our way that people have regarding the false doctrines and teachings that are out in the world. Father, we pray that you'll bless Ted tonight as he speaks to us. Give him ready mind, Father, to be able to share those things he's prepared. We're thankful, Father, for his work, for his ability, his family, and the fact that he can be here with us tonight to share important information, Father, that can better equip us to be your servants. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your care, especially on our sick, and we know that list is very long. We pray you'll, Father, hear those prayers that we offer up for the specific individuals, and Father, use us to be encouragement to the, those who are suffering and need your care. And Father, we just thank you for your church. Pray, Father, that you'll bless it with opportunities, that the doors will be there for us to, Father, find the good and open hearts. Thank you, Father, for Jesus most of all and the sacrifice he's made and thankful for the forgiveness of sins we have in him. It's his name we pray. Amen.
give me just a second. Can you hear me now? All right. I'm not going to talk too much about myself. The two most important things that happened in my life were 57 years ago I was baptized into Christ. 44 years ago I married the love of my life, Sherry. Other than that, we have been together for that long a period of time and we have been preaching, I have been for 40 years. Uh, started off in a small town called well, Scott City. If it's in South Missouri, down in cotton country. And I picked cotton as a young boy also. So yes, I'm a cotton picking preacher. <laughs> I also, then after that, we went to another little place called Fruitland and we were in Cape Girada. We started the congregation in Arlington and then we arrived in Sparta and we've been there 19 years. Short history of preaching career. It's been wonderful, it's been good, it has ups, it has down, but God has blessed us through it all, and I know he's blessing you here, here. And we're so thankful. We were so wonderfully enjoyed the visitation we've had already with you guys, and you're so wonderful and so friendly and so kind, you don't know what it means to us. To know that we can come to Marshfield and we step right into the family of God with such love. Thank you very much. We're going to talk tonight about music in worship. We know that the church of Jesus Christ that he purchased with his blood worships differently in song or in music than do the denominations around us. We don't have choruses, we don't have choirs, we don't have special singing groups, we don't even have instruments of music, even a piano. We simply lift up our voices to God and we sing. And I want to look at four points tonight involving what God has commanded us to do as music in our worship. Point number one. We must sing according to the truth. Point number two, we must sing the truth. Point number three, we must be truthful about what we sing. And point number four, let's look at some reasons people want to give for justifying the use of instrumental music. So let's begin. We've got a ways to go. And it's, what time do I stop? 30 minutes, would that be like 20 till? All right, point number one. Worshiping by singing according to the truth, which is doing right in the sight of God. It is being obedient in faith to him and what he says to do in singing. If we go to Romans 10, 17, you know what it says. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We know if Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us that without faith we cannot please him. So what does the Bible say about singing according to God's truth? Look at John chapter 4, verse 23, if you will, or mark it down, because there the words of Jesus are important to us. He says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we learn three things from that passage of Scripture. Number one, God is the object of our worship, correct? Therefore, God is seeking true worshipers. Therefore, we must worship him in proper spirit. That is, we must have the proper heart and the proper mind. We must understand what we are singing as well as know and mean what we sing. Do you mean what you sing when you sing those words of our hymns? And third, we must worship God in truth or according to his word. So, let's look at these verses in light of singing. Because singing is an act of worship. So whatever is said in John 3, 20, or John 4, 23 and 24 about worship applies to singing. First of all, as we just stated, we sing songs, we don't use instruments because we are singing and worshiping God in truth. And God expects his worshipers to be true worshipers. By the way, what would that imply to you? If there are true worshipers, can there be false worshipers? Certainly. So he's seeking true worshipers. If you will, along with that, God wants us to have a proper desire in worshiping him, a proper spirit. I love what David said about worship in Psalm 122 and verse 1 when he says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Let's go worship God. It made him so happy. How does it make us feel when we come to worship? It's a thrill, isn't it? It's an honor to pour out our praise in worship and in song to Almighty God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3 tells us this. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome to us. They are a joy to us. Why do we worship God? Because we love Him and we want to pour out our praise to Him. So we sing songs like, All hail the power of Jesus' name. 
Let angels prostrate fall. Are we singing songs like, Our God, He is alive. And when you sing that, brothers and sisters, you are singing with joy praises to the Almighty Creator who made you in His likeness. That is a joy to do. And so when we sing, it's not a burden, it is a joy. Look at Ephesians 5 and verse 19. What does it say? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace or thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. Singing is worship and it's authorized by God. And his children sing because they love him and they want to praise him. Sometimes, have you ever noticed a Christian sitting in worship not singing? That's always baffled me. I wondered, why aren't you singing and praising Almighty God in song? Have you ever wondered what kind of influence that would have on a neighbor? Or somebody that's visiting the congregation that's not a Christian? Or your children and your wife or your family? What does it say when we don't sing and worship to God? We are also, again, to sing with the proper spirit. That's what God is looking for, people who worship in proper spirit. So we must sing in spirit. What does that mean? We sing with our heart, and we sing with our mind. And we sing understanding what the words are that we are singing, and we mean the words that we are singing. If you're singing without understanding, if you're singing without meaning the words that you are singing, that is vain worship. I will never say amen to a prayer that I did not understand the words to or was not scripturally given. I will not sing a song that is not scriptural in its content. I can't do that because we are to sing praises to God that are scriptural in proper spirit. How about, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing? Does everybody know that one? O Thou Fount of Every Blessing? Well, in line two it has this statement. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither for thy help I have come. When I was young, I sang that and I didn't know what I was singing. I led that song. I didn't know what it meant. But I know now that it has reference to 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. After Israel had gained a great victory over the Philistines, Samuel set up a stone between Mizpah and Shin, and he called it Ebenezer, stone of help. And he said these words, Thus far the Lord has helped us, his people. So the stone represented God's help over his people. So when we sing, here I raise my Ebenezer, we are singing figuratively, God is here to help me. God is my help. Remember what it says in Matthew 19 and verse 26, with God what, brethren? All things are possible. So glad to be able to sing, here I raise my Ebenezer. God is my help. How about this song? Night with Eben Pinion. Brooded o'er the veil. What does that mean? Well, ebon is black. Pinion is wing. Brooded over the veil. It's hanging over the valley. So it is a look symbolically at the death of Jesus. Remember the sorrow, the trials, and the darkness? Jesus went through all of that to die for me. So when I sing, Night with ebon pinion, Brooded over the veil, I'm singing about my Lord's sacrifice for my life. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? But if we don't know what we're singing, it's not correct worship. So we need to know what we are singing. That's important. But also concentrating on and thinking about the words and their meaning is important to us. That's what it means. So often, you can concentrate on the notes of the song to make sure you're hitting them right, or the time signature, or the hand movement of the song leader as he's directing you. And forget that it is God looking for a true worshiper that has a heart that is properly set towards him and means the words that we offer up to him. That's what he's looking for. And that's what he expects from us. Remember, when we sing, it goes back to Hebrews 13 and verse 15. Listen. When we are singing, we are offering a sacrifice of praise unto God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. What an honor. Now, am I more interested in how pretty I sound when I sing or the meaning of the words that I offer to God? I think we should try to sound good, don't get me wrong, but the primary reason we sing is to praise God in heaven. 
and offer up his our meaning to him in those words. Worship requires efforts, and we need to focus our hearts and our minds on singing properly. We worship a God that has sovereign ruler over our lives, who created us in his own image. And I believe that God deserves my respect, my humility, and my proper spirit. Don't you? Give him everything that you have in your worship when you sing. And sing in truth or according to what God has given us. We don't use instrumental music. Why? It's not because we don't like instruments, right? I play a guitar. I love guitar. I love banjo. I love piano. I love instruments of all kind. But that doesn't give me the right to play them in worship service. We don't play them or use them in worship because God has not permitted us to. He has not authorized us to use instruments of music. And everything we do must come under the authority of God. Let me give you this. The Lord instructed us on how to partake or what to use in the Lord's Supper, right? Well, let me ask you, how many of you love peanut butter and jelly? Raise your hand. How many of you love milk with it? Hey, why don't we use that on the Lord's Supper? Because he didn't authorize it. He didn't say use it. But somebody will say he didn't say not to use it, right? God doesn't authorize in that way. He authorizes by what he says expressly or through necessary inference or through approved examples. So God said this in Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Use unleavened bread, use the fruit of the vine as the emblems of taking the Lord's Supper. And when he said that, that settles the matter, right? You don't have to say everything else you can't use because he said what to use. That's how God authorizes something. So what did he say about our music? Ephesians 5 and verse 19. You are to sing and what? Make melody in your hearts to the Lord. Is that enough said? That should be enough for anybody. What God says authorizes and he doesn't have to say everything that he hasn't authorized in that regard. So when I use an instrument, I add to God's authority and I speak where God has not spoken. Colossians 3.17 should be in your hearts and your minds. What does it say? Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all how? In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If a policeman yells at you, Rick, stop in the name of the law. He has the authority to say that because he has given that authority by the law. And the same thing holds true for worship. We do everything under the authority of God or what comes out of his law, the word, the New Testament. Therein lies our authority. <clears throat> this very basic Bible principle, though, just notice how much it's being ignored around us. But even more so, it's bothering me because I see it more and more being ignored in the church. And people, when they ignore God's authority, are going to do what? Whatever they please. And then they will find a reason to justify what they are doing. And then the scriptures are used in a mis- or are used wrongly. It doesn't say not to do it. Let me give you a scenario. Sherry and I decide to go on vacation, and we hire a contractor to remodel our kitchen while we're gone. We want them to redo the tile. We want them to paint the ceiling and the walls. We come back, and the bill that we receive is four times greater than was promised. And we find out that not only did he do what we said, but he also tore down the wall between the kitchen and the dining room, built a deck on the back with sliding doors that led from the kitchen to the deck. And I said, I'm not paying for that. I didn't tell you to do that. And then he says to me, but you didn't say not to. And we take that into a court. Who is going to win that case? Don't we understand the principle of authority in our daily lives? Why don't we understand it where it really matters, in spiritual matters, where God says, here's what I want you to do in worship. That should settle the matter because that's the authority, not man. And so when he says, I want you to sing, I want you to make melody in your hearts to the Lord. It settles the matter for me. And I'm not going to add anything to it or take anything away from it. I'm going to do what the Lord says. And that's how I please him. That's what faith is. And without it, you will never please God. And when we ignore the principle of authority 
anything goes, the door is wide open. So now it's no longer the will of God. It's my personal preference that's going to decide what is authorized and what is not authorized if I ignore the will of God. If we do not worship God according to the truth in singing, are we true worshipers? And if we are not in true worship to God, then what is it? It is vain worship. Look at Matthew 15 and verse 9. Jesus said this, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. It is also ignorant worship, or worship without knowledge. If you look at Acts 17 and verse 23, Paul went through the city of Athens. He saw all the altars, and he saw one that said, it was an inscription to the unknown God. And so he said to them, The one who you worship without knowing, ignorantly, him I proclaim to you. And so it's not only vain worship, but it's worship of ignorance or without knowledge. But it's also self-imposed worship. It's will worship. And that is condemned by Paul in Colossians 2 and verse 23. So, number one, we must worship according to the truth. Number two, we must sing the truth. When a preacher stands up before you and heralds his message, when a teacher in a classroom proclaims to you a lesson, don't you want to make sure that it comes from only one place, the Word of God, where truth is found? Thy Word is truth, John 17 and verse 17. That's what we must expect because, brethren, we're held accountable for what we teach. And it frightens me if I would teach something falsely and lead one of God's souls astray. James 3 and verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall incur a what? Stricter judgment. God holds us accountable for what we teach. And if I lead a soul astray, Paul tells us, I am accursed. Galatians 1 verse 8 and 9. And that's not going to happen if we tell the truth. So in light of this fact, one thing we must remember, we sing to praise God, but when we sing, we are also teaching. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, and notice what Paul says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We are not only praising God, we are teaching. So if singing involves teaching, is it okay to sing false doctrine? No. We would not allow a preacher to stand up for very long and teach false doctrine here, would you? then why would we take a song that has the same false doctrine that was taught from the pulpit and sing it in our songs? It's the same thing. We must not sing that which we would not preach. We only sing that which we can preach and teach to others. And that's the gospel truth. We know also that all the songs that are in our song books are not scripturally based. Some of them are written by people who have backgrounds from denominations. And a lot of them will sing about premillennialism. Or they'll sing about the sinner's prayer. Or they will sing about a false error teaching about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives today and so on. So we must be very careful that we are singing those songs that are scripturally based. My dad used to say, I'll never forget it, he was a man of little quips. It is just as important to sing the truth as it is to preach and teach the truth. Nothing could be more correct. And so, we must have vigilant elders who watch over everything that is taught, whether it's in song, in preaching, in teaching, in tracts, in any materials that we have. Everything must be guarded and watched over by our elders diligently because it doesn't take much to lead people astray today. And we've got to make certain that only the truth is being taught, sung, and preached, and other things. We must sing the truth, number three. I've got to move on. We must be truthful about what we sing. How many of you know Revelation 21, verse 8? All liars have a part where? In the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. But also we need to understand, it's wrong for you to make a promise that you do not intend to keep. 
And that's a trap we can fall into when we're singing. We sing songs and we don't really have the mindset that we intend to keep what we're singing. Years ago, I had a friend who wrote an article for a church bulletin. And in it, he was saying these things tongue-in-cheek. He just wanted to make a point. His point was this, and he named his little lesson the way we would sing if we were honest. And he wanted to make a point. So he would write the names of the song and then said, is this more honest? And put it over here. So let me give you four examples. Oh, how I love Jesus. And he said, maybe it should be, oh, how I like Jesus. He said, he's everything to me. He means quite a bit to me. Uh, so he, he put down this. He said, all to Jesus I surrender. And then he said, maybe it should be some things to Jesus I surrender. I love to tell the story. I love to talk about telling the story. When we sing, do we mean what we are singing? And do we have every intention of being honest and carrying through on those things and living up to it? Or maybe it's just we don't have our mind in the proper spirit and we're not thinking about the words as we should and we don't really even know what we're saying to God. Either way, we want to make certain <clears throat> that we are truthfully going to carry out the words that we sing. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Toiling on, toiling on. Which means I'm going to give everything I have to God. When you sing that, do you mean it? I know a guy that sang it this week and he didn't come to services next week. Toiling on, toiling on. Do we mean truthfully what we sing? All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. What does that mean to you? Does it mean he's first and foremost in your life? Does it mean you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Or are we seeing that more like this? All to Jesus I surrender after I get done with my own desires. He can have everything left. Or is he first and foremost? Listen to this. Here's a song my dad loved. Where he leads, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. How many unfaithful Christians have sung that song? I'll go with him all the way. What is the promise of Jesus in Revelation 2 and verse 10? You finish this. Be faithful until death. I'll give you the crown of life. But what's the condition? Be with me all the way. When you sing that song, are you making that commitment? Are you going to truthfully do what you sing to God? Number four. Let's look at some reasoning why people say we can use instrumental music. Number one, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I think we're all very familiar with this one. This is one of my brother's favorite who left the church and now is in a community church. My nephew played a guitar in their band in worship. And it saddens me. I'm not saying that I'm proud, but this is what's happening. And he tells me all the time, if God permitted instruments in the Old Testament, certainly he would want us to enjoy them in the New Testament. Does that even make sense to you? Does God always demand the same things in every age of time? Does he demand the same thing in the Mosaic age that he demanded in the patriarchal age? No. It was more. Does he demand the same thing of us today in the New Testament system as he did under the Old Testament economy of Moses? No. So you can't say it happened then, it should happen now. It happens as God says it happens. And he gives everybody in a different period of time his rules for that age. So we are accountable to the New Testament, not to the Old Testament, right? What does it say in Colossians 2 and verse 14? Jesus did what with the old law? He nailed it to the cross. Do you know in the Greek that means permanently? He nailed it permanently to the cross. It's never coming back. And so to say I'm going to take this and use it in the New Testament is a violation of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 16. <clears throat> there we are told that when the testator dies, his testament goes into effect. So when Jesus died, what went into effect, brethren? His testament, the New Testament. What also happened to the Old Testament so the New Testament could go into effect? It was abolished, nailed to the cross permanently. So we went from the old to the new. Just because they used instruments under the old law, 
is not a reason we can use them under the new. The reason we could use them under the new is God authorized it, which he did not. So we've got to think about that. Second argument. <clears throat> the New Testament does not specifically condemn the use of instrumental music within the scriptures. Can you show me a place in the New Testament that says, don't use instruments? How many of you have heard that argument? What do you think about that argument? I'll take you back to what I was talking about a while ago. Remember when I pointed out that I like peanut butter and jelly and milk? Can you show me a scripture where the Bible says I cannot use that on the Lord's Supper? You can't, can you? What can you show me? You can show me where he said what to use. And that excludes everything else. Authority that comes to us from God comes from what he says, not from where he is silent on something. So you've got to remember that. Authority comes from what he says, not from what is not said. So, let me give you an example. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 4, we are told that Jesus could never be a priest on earth. Who can tell me why? He wasn't from the tribe of what? What tribe was he from? Judah. So what difference does that make? Can you show me a scripture where it specifically says that a person from the tribe of Judah cannot be a priest? You can't. But you can show me Hebrews 7 verse 14. Turn there and read it with me. Hebrews 7 verse 14. Notice what he says. In Hebrews 7 verse 14. It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So with nothing being said by Moses of a priest coming out of the tribe of Judah, no authority was given. What tribe did God speak of that he gave the authority for priests to come from? The Levites. Look at Exodus 32. Do you know why he consecrated them? Because the Levites stood with Moses when that golden calf was made. And then later on, he designated them in ceremonies. Numbers 1, Numbers 8, to be his priest. My priests are from Levi. That settles the matter. Moses never spoke about the tribe of Judah because God did not authorize it. In silence, Judah was said, no, nor any other tribe but Levi could the priest come from. So when God speaks, that settles it. And if God has not authorized a certain practice, did he authorize for us burning of incense? No. Did he authorize us to use instruments because he used them in the Old Testament? No. If it's found, it must be found under the new law, the law of Jesus Christ. Silence is prohibitive. It's never permissive. When God authorizes, it's through what he says expressly, through necessary inference or approved example. And there's none of that, not example, not inference, or express statement that we use instruments. But he expressly states what? Sing. Make melody in your hearts to the Lord. So let's go to a third argument. The Greek word translated in Ephesians 5.19, making melody, is the word solo. And it means, back in the original part of it, to twitch, to pluck, to twang. So many people will say, because of that, innate in the word solo is instruments, stringed instruments. I want you to go to Ephesians 5 and I want you to look at verse 19 because you will notice that in that verse, Brother Rick, you know this, does it tell us what instrument to use? What does he say? Sing and make melody where? In your heart. Does all of us have a mind, a heart, by which we can sing to God? Absolutely. So I want you to sing and make melody in your heart. That's the spiritual instrument. There is no idea in the word silo. When it was written for the Bible to inherit or to inherit to a musical instrument that is a physical one. It is a spiritual instrument. Sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. No mechanical instruments are found within that passage of Scripture. Secondly, even if this verse did allow instruments, which it does not, do you know every one of us would have to play one? That verse, Ephesians 5.19, is written to the church as a whole, to every individual within it. Just like he commands all of us to sing, if it were stringed instruments, it would be a command for all of us to play it. 
You cannot have somebody take the Lord's Supper for you. You cannot have somebody sing for you. And if we used instruments, which we do not, you could have no one play for you as well. You would be required to learn and play a stringed instrument. But they're not willing to go there. Now, number four. What about the book of Revelation? Are there any references in the book of Revelation to stringed instruments? How about the harp? Yeah. Well, it's a symbolic. It's not telling us to play harps. It's used symbolically like many things that are brought out of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Whether it's a burning of incense, the golden incense, the altar, and so on. So you cannot go into the book of Revelation, a book of symbols, pull that out and say, this authorizes us to use stringed instruments. That's not the purpose of symbols. It has a meaning, but it's not to play musical instruments. So that's not a big deal. People don't usually bring that up, but be aware of it. What about this? This may be a little more difficult. I just recently had somebody say to me, Salva I mean, playing an instrument, music is really not an issue of salvation. And so it doesn't really matter if you play an instrument or not. When somebody says that to me, they are making an admission that instruments are not justified by New Testament teaching. I want you to go back to the time of Cain and Abel. Did it matter how they worshipped God? It did, didn't it? If you will, look at 1 John chapter two and verse, or chapter 3 and verse 12. And there it compares Cain and Abel. And here's what it says. His works, or Cain's works, were evil. His brothers were righteous. Whose sacrifice did God accept? Abel's. Why? He offered it in faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 4. What did Cain do? He changed what God authorized and offered something that God had not stated. Did God say, don't offer the first of your ground? No. He said, offer this, and that should have settled it. And so when God says, sing, sing. And don't add something to it. Go to Nadab and Abihu. Who were they? Leviticus chapter 10. Who are Nadab and Abihu? Priest, right? From the tribe of Levi. Their father was Aaron, the high priest. And so what do we have? They offered up what to God? Strange fire. Only one thing out of several things that they did, they did wrong. And what happened to them? God struck them dead, consumed them. Worship does matter. Singing matters. How we worship God matters. Again, go back to John chapter 4, verse 24. What does the Bible say there? What did Jesus say? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him. How? in spirit and truth. On and on we could go. Playing an instrument. I have a talent to do that. God wants me to use my talent. If I don't, I'm sinning. I can paint. I know people that can dance. I'm not saying it's right. But I know people who might have the talent to dance or cook a meal. Do we bring our talents of those into the worship as well? Just because you can play an instrument doesn't mean God wants you to. How do we determine what God wants? By what he has authorized in his word. If God based worship on talents, he would not have given us the five specific acts of worship in the New Testament by which we are to worship him. He would just say, just use your talents and act naturally when you worship. But no, he said, here's what I want you to do. And he gives those five acts of worship. And so brethren, let's not fall for that either. What if somebody says to you, we play music in our homes, we can play it in church. That opens the door too. Other things that you do in your home that are acceptable wouldn't be acceptable in worship. How many of us would want to eat a common meal as a worship to God? Well, don't we do that at home? What happened to the church in Corinth when they turned the Lord's Supper into a common meal? Paul chastised them for that and said, don't do that anymore. I have about 10 other things I could go over and I'm out of time. If you want to have these, I will send them to you in letter form so that you can have them and post them or use them in the church here. There are at least 12 different things that I have had thrown at me in my life as a preacher on why people can play instrumental music. I don't think my wife will mind telling you this, but she grew up in the Baptist church. She was really good on the piano. And I'm telling you what, it was difficult for her. So have compassion with people. 
when they are saying these things. They're very serious about what they believe, and so are we. So we've got to show them with reason and with logic from the Scripture that what they are doing is not authorized by God. So let me leave you again with one verse. Colossians 3 and verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you'll stand on safe ground. Let's lead other people to the truth of how we worship God. And when it comes to music, we sing, and God is pleased. Add anything, take that away. You're no longer under his authority. Thank you, folks. I went over a little bit, Rick. You preachers do that.
Well, good evening. It's good to see everybody out in the middle of the week. Before we begin our devotional, we just have a few announcements that we'll make. First and foremost, uh, thank you, Brother Spencer, for the fine class that we had. Um, there will be a VBS meeting shortly after the devotional uh, in the fellowship room for everyone. Please, uh, those who are involved, attend. Um, the setup will be Saturday, and basically pick up a bulletin if you're involved because there's a lot of information. It's going to be a busy week next week, and that's a good week. Um, but certainly uh, from snack items to decorations that are needed, uh, please refer to that, and uh, it's going to be a good week. In terms of those that are sick, uh, Kevin's going to have some results coming up pretty soon on his back, so pray for that. Tom Ellingsworth, also keep him in your prayers as he's got an infection and needing uh, our prayers. Uh, Connie Isis, uh, she's going to be doing a stress test, so hopefully everything goes well with that. And Brother Jerry's going to be having an echocardiogram, so... We have several that are in need of our prayers, and please uh, look at the bulletin and keep them on your list at home. Um, it does say here, also I forgot to mention, uh, set up on uh, VBS will be 9 o'clock Saturday morning. The uh, jail ministry is going very well. Uh, we had four baptisms on Sunday. Um, for those who are able, there's a... They're pretty strict about what they allow in there. I don't know. I found that out as I go in every week. Uh, they frisked us down good Sunday. You can't just send anything down there, but there is a, if you'll pick up a postcard, um, if you want to send uh, some, just a card of encouragement to those that were baptized, we've got their names, and this would be something that would be able to be given to them. So, um there's a few now, but there will be more of them Sunday available. And that's the announcements that I've got. Um, certainly if there's more, let me know and I'll make sure to announce them Sunday. But before we begin our devotional, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Father, for the opportunity in the middle of the week to come together with our brothers and sisters and in fellowship with one another and in fellowship with your truth. Open it and study from it and take those things that are in it that we need and use of our lives every single day of those things that we should abstain from and avoid and for those things that we should do that we should cleave to and those things that you've instructed us to do father we are so thankful for the wisdom and guidance that we receive from your word and for the salvation that it contains in it and we pray father would ever be faithful to it and that we would continue to demonstrate our faith in our lives and it would be easy for those that are around us to see that we're your children Father, for the sacrifice that Christ came and lived his life perfectly on this earth and went to Calvary's cross for us, for the church that he bled and died for, Father, we're so very thankful for the salvation that it holds for us. And we pray, Father, that we simply continue to be mindful of our blessings that we have in this life, that they're, our spiritual blessings are the richest blessings we have. May we ever be mindful of that, and for all that we have, we're thankful, Father. And be with us now as we enter into this devotion time, and we pray that everything that we do is glorifying in your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Hope everyone's doing good this evening. Had a pretty good week. Hope you all brought your musical instrument. Just kidding. If you said your voice, you're right. Oh, I'm just kidding. That was a good lesson, Brother Spencer. I'm glad you and your wife could be here this evening. Our, uh, our first song
Our invitation song will be 535. I'd like to read to you from Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One thing I pray for tonight, literally and also something that I would love to see in my mind's eye. Literally, I would love to see this congregation rejoice tonight. And in my mind's eye, I would love to see heaven rejoice and the angels rejoice around the throne of God because one comes home to God. If you're here tonight and you are considering your life and where you are at, I can tell you from a long year of living as our life as living as a Christian, there is no better life than living with Jesus. One day he's coming to take us to be home with him. And I want to make absolutely certain that you are a part of the kingdom that he delivers to the Father at the end time. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. So please tonight, would you help this congregation rejoice? Would you make the angels in heaven sound out in rejoicing tonight by obeying the gospel? Or perhaps you are a Christian that has erred from the truth and need to come home. Either way, there's going to be rejoicing if you respond to the gospel as we stand and sing this song. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today Yes, I'm in the glory land way I'm in the glory land, worry land way I'm in the glory land way Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, oh Listen to obey for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear for. I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go, rejoicing in His love. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Soon I shall see Him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clear for I'm in the glory.
would you all please bow with me? Our most gracious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, as once again we humbly approach your throne of grace and glory, thanking you for this glorious day that you blessed us with. And we pray, dear Lord, as we go through our lives, we will let our light shine to let others realize how blessed we are as your children and help us to share each and every opportunity we have of how much you've done for us and how much joy there is in being one of your children. Let us go forth the rest of this week with a smile on our face and a song in our hearts to answer that great question that anyone would ask, why we are so happy. Once again, we thank you for prayers on behalf of all the ones that are needing health issues, and we pray you'd continue to be with the ones that have lost loved ones. Sometimes it's a such a struggle to fill that void that we had for the ones we were so close to. Help us stay strong and true. And as the devil throws those flaming darts at us, we put on the full armor to shed those darts that we can keep our eyes focused on that heavenly goal and never look back. Bless us and keep us in all things as we strive to be your children. And most of all, forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, amen.